Okay, well, I just wanted to talk about the day I met Dad. Um, it was October the 10th, 1976. So it's been 41 years ago. And it was a blind date, and it was kind of cool outside. Actually, the wind was blowing, the leaves were everywhere. And he was just a little bit late getting there. And I'm thinking, hmm, so he's one of those that's a little bit late. And I opened the door when he finally came, and it was cool outside, and he was really perspiring. So I thought, woo, I better go slow with this one. He's scared to death. And so that's kind of how it all began. And um, after he came in the house and we were talking, and I, I think I teased him a little bit about being late, and he said, he says, you have no idea how hard it was for me to come in here. He says, I drove up and down the street about a dozen times, and I kept looking at your house, and I drive back and forth and back and forth. And so he finally stopped. And so that's how it began. And our actual first date was we went to a haunted house, and then we went to dinner. Um, we, had a, we had a really good time, and so he came in, and I said, um, would you like to have some lemonade? And he goes, oh, yeah. Well, I had no idea that Dick didn't drink. And so I had this lemonade that I had fixed, and I put a shot of vodka in it. And he took it, and he gulped it down. And I thought, whew, boy, he likes to drink. Now, I'm fixing this right in front of him. So he takes, I said, did you want another one? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. So I fixed another one. He gulped it down, and he turned his head and the room went round and he started spinning. And he says, did you put something in my lemonade? And I said, well, yeah, some vodka. He goes, I don't drink. I said, oh my gosh. And I thought, oh, I'll never see him again. I will, boy, I, I, you know, I thought, man, I messed this up. I'll never see him again. And so he had to sit down on the couch and he stayed like an extra two hours because I didn't have any coffee to give him because I didn't drink coffee. And he said to Chris, he didn't feel good, and he was really, really sick. And I thought, I'll never see him again. But the next day, he sent me some flowers. So Dick was always kind of intimidated by his grandchildren, not knowing, in a sense, what to say. He, he held every one of them when they were first babies. And then it was like, you'd never catch Dick changing pants or anything, diapers. And um, Cassie and Megan were here for a week, and they were very young and we were on our way to Young's Jersey Dairy. And he'd never said anything to either one of them. And they used to just kind of look at him. So they're sitting in the back seat and Cassie's kicking the back seat real hard. And finally he goes, stop that. And she says, Grandma, he's talking to me. <laughs> and you know, and all I could do was laugh. I mean, and even he started laughing. And so it's always been kind of a joke that we've told about Grandpa's first speaking to one of the grandchildren was, stop that. <laughs> and I also know that Dick was proud of his family, including his dogs. Now the dogs need some training that they never really received, <laughs> but just about every one of our dogs would get away with things that the, ch the kids wouldn't get away with. And believe me, we took it on the chin many times about how the dogs were allowed to do things and the boys were not allowed to do things. Um, and that's actually very true. I have to admit that that's very, very true. Um, I've got fond memories of, of, of fishing and, and going to the shooting range with him and us going boating and being at Indian Lake and, and then another time when we were out the rain just kept pouring in and all of a sudden it was a big deluge and we had to try to get the cover on and cover everybody up. Um, and I also remember getting up early in the morning and him taking me to breakfast by the boat. We'd drive someplace and go to breakfast. Those, those were things I, I remember that were really fun. When I was little, we used to go on some of my fondest memories of the vacations. And, and when we were little, um, this was a long time ago, and this is before Route 75 was finished. So uh, there would be detours off the interstate, and the detours would go through the mountains, the Smoky Mountains, and they'd go up and down. There'd be this long train of cars going up and down and turning and twisting around these mountain roads, these back mountain roads. And uh, of course, we're in a station wagon, and I remember uh, us just starting to barf. You know, barf all over the place, and because it was just, it was hard. It was hard riding, and, and uh, we used to get something called vitamin P. He gave us Finnegan to settle our stomachs, and I remember feeling I was I was a real big boy because both of my brothers got shots in, in their rear ends, but um, I got to take a pill because I hadn't barfed all over the car yet. So I, I thought it was a pretty big deal then. So we took a trip to see out west, Grand Canyon, all that kind of stuff. We had a 25 foot motorhome, so you could drive and they could sleep or whatever. 
we back into that campsite and it's late evening or late afternoon, you know, five o'clock, five thirty. And we get all backed in and situated and everything all hooked up and he says, Well let's dump the tanks. So he's outside hooking the hose up and everything like that. And there's his family right at the end of our concrete pad at a picnic table that had just gotten a great big bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken with all the fixings, and they're all sitting around ready to have family time. And he yells for me to pull the plunger on the toilet inside. We pull the plunger on the toilet inside, and Dad didn't have both sides of the hose clipped on. It clear across all the concrete slab rolls RV blue water with toilet paper and poop. And that family's eating right next to And he to says, it? I guess we're going out to dinner. <laughs> so the story I've got is the one that sticks with me is when uh, one evening, Grandpa had gone out to the pick and pack to pick up milk. And on his way back, apparently someone followed him home. And after he pulled his car in, he opens his door and there's a guy standing there and says, give me all your money. And Grandpa says, got him. You, you know, calls him an SOB, tells him where to go and all that. And the guy proceeds to hit him in the head with a pipe. And then Dad yells out the window, you guys got it out. Cause he thinks it's Grandpa and Rick acting up and cause they would always give each other grief. And Dad sees it's not Grandpa. I mean, it's not Rick. And he, so all of a sudden I'm up by the kitchen and I see my father running by in his underwear throwing a clip on a 45, cocking it, and opening the front door wide, imposing to fire, and I see this car s speed up the hill and speed away. And then, next thing I know, Dad's brought Grandpa into the kitchen. He's shifted into the physician mode. He's got his medical bag. He's opening it up, and he starts to uh, clean Grandpa up. And I, and I hear this, you know, various profanity, and, uh, um, and they just, I hear this throughout the time, and I, every now and then I kind of peek. I was in the family room, I peek and I'd see it, and my grandpa quincing and twitching, and and, uh, and then once it's done, dad goes, there's that Novocaine. And, uh, um, and years later, I asked dad about this, and I asked him two questions. I said, I asked him, well, why didn't you shoot? And he said, well, I'm never gonna shoot someone who's fleeing. I'm never going to shoot someone like that. Um, and I asked him, well, why'd you, why'd you sew his head up without Novocaine? He said, well, and he, he did this with kind of a half wry smile. He says, well, I kind of figured he was half lit most of the time. So that's probably a kind of a cherished memory of Dad. He, had, uh, he, he went right from protector to physician uh, to a uh, uh, comedian. One of the best memories I have taken away is uh, two summers ago, uh, uh, Dad and Mom came out to the lake, and uh, I knew he was coming out, and so I purposely booked a, um, a guided fishing trip to go on. And uh, unfortunately, the weather turned bad, and it was very cold, and I was worried about it raining and, and, and being uh, him not wanting to go on that day. But uh, I didn't tell him about it ahead of time because he had a habit of finding excuses not to go on things and be adventurous. And so I sprung it on him at the last minute, even though mom knew about it. And uh, we went out, um, it was him and me and Cassie and Megan. And uh, we uh, caught a lot of fish. And uh, I think the best best part of the day was when he, when he caught his first fish, uh, he told the, uh, the guide that he hadn't been fishing in almost 15 years and he was so excited to, to catch a couple fish and uh, share the day with, with me and, and the girls. And so that was pretty exciting. He came out this summer with you? He did, yeah, that, that was good. He was, uh, he was very sick and um, mom wanted to come out because it was, it was hot and she wanted to uh, come out and check out the, the, the lake. And um, I made arrangements for her to come out and she called at the last minute and said, uh, dad really wants to come out. Um, the first day he was just kind of sleeping, hanging out, you know, trying to be cordial. And then uh, the second day he kind of had a, um, a moment where he got out on the boat and it was sunny and suddenly he's got his shirt off and he's sunbathing 
and uh, enjoying himself on the boat. And uh, and every single day after that, I'd wake up and he'd be down on the on the boat drinking coffee in the morning in the sun, and just really enjoying himself. So that was that was a really neat thing to see, um, and uh, spend some quality time with him uh, this past summer. When I was in college, like late high school, college times, that dad would make these big weekend plans with the boys. And what we would do is uh, we would all meet up at a place that is at the trout club for a weekend. We'd go there Friday and we'd stay through Sunday or late Saturday, sometimes late Saturday, late, sometimes Sunday, but we would stay up all night, Friday night fishing. And we would go up with his friends and stuff. There were a couple times that uh, we didn't catch any fish, uh, not even bites. And then so dad would take us over to this other area and we'd fish, we'd start on the reel and we just catch it left and right, left and right. Found out it was the nursery. That's where they were, that's where they would, <laughs> that's where the fish would be born and raised before they were thrown into the other stream. So we were, we were catching the babies, but hey, we were catching fish. <laughs> well, there was a time where I had just had my license for six months and I decided to go skiing. So me and my brother, we, Rick, drove to Pennsylvania first and we were gonna go skiing and when we got there we were skiing for just a little bit and it started raining it started pouring so we decided to go to another ski place which was up in New York well it was a good night's drive so we after skiing all day we decided to drive all night to New York and make a long story short I hit black ice totaled a car uh, we made arrangements to get Rick, Rick and I were not hurt luckily made arrangements to get back and the night I got back uh, Greg was moving his room around, and he decided that he was going to start filling his waterbed. Yes, this is the waterbed story. He was going to start filling his waterbed, so he started filling his waterbed. I was watching TV out in the other room, and he came out, wanted to go out and hang, hang out with some of his friends, so he said, hey, can you watch my bed, turn it off in a little bit? Sure, whatever. I had just gotten back from totally in my car, and he wants me to watch his waterbed. I didn't care. I was watching TV. I thought I was in trouble. So uh, next thing I know, I can't remember if it was dad or mom. One of them woke up, woke me up, screaming, asking me what was going on. I didn't know. You know, you wake up, you don't know what's going on. They said the waterbed's about to blow up. And I, of course, I didn't understand what was going on because I just woke up. But I walked in there. The waterbed was twice as big as it normally is. The floorboards in the house started to creak. And it was just crazy. Dad ran. It's funny. Dad ran and got his camera. And he took a picture of the waterbed. Uh, and then uh, the waterbed didn't blow up. What actually happened is the pedestal collapsed and it poked a hole in the bed. And then we literally had six inches of water in the bedroom, which was on the second floor. Water was going through the ceiling, going through the air ducts. Uh, a friend of my parents, Harold Pollins, came over with a sump pump. We were pumping water out of the bedroom. And uh, that was the infamous waterbed story of the Potts household.